So um, we will we'll wait one more minute for people to filter in and then, then we will begin. It is for some reason very cold in my office and so I'm wearing a blanket. <laughs> So anyway, um, so what I find it was that that I came up with quite interesting how the very beginning. Okay, so um, we're going to begin this session. Hold on, I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to use my computer. All right. Um, hmm. All right, so for those of you that have seen some of these before, this one is gonna be different. Some of the initial slides will be the same in case there are people here who don't know some of the terms that we're working with. Um, but so I've been doing these sessions for a, a year or two, I don't remember. Um, and they're based on my research and my, um, it, they're really based on my research, to be honest. Um, they're based on my personal experiences only insofar as that I will tell you things that my research says that I don't personally ever actually accomplish. Um, and so this one, we're focusing on teaching with executive dysfunction because I'd had a number of people ask me about this problem. Um, and so just an introduction to me, for those of you who don't know me, I am Ruel Williams. I'm an assistant professor at Purdue University. I teach for the user experience design program and I research technology and ethics and the politics of disability. Um, and so my work is informed by critical disability studies, science and technology studies, uh, human computer interaction, design and engineering. I primarily focus on ethical reform in research and of researchers. So, um, but I also sometimes do that by doing sneaky little projects that show researchers how to not be weird about disabled people. Um, and so what brought you all here today uh, usually I advertise these or, you know, write about them as though they're for neurodivergent people, and they are, but not everybody recognizes that they may belong in the neurodiversity umbrella. And so you might be here because you are struggling with all of the different responsibilities and tasks associated with teaching. Uh, um, we're focusing on higher education here, but I didn't limit attendance based on that. Uh, and so um, you may be experiencing issues just because you're aging or you have ADHD, OCD, autism, traumatic brain injury, chronic illness, but also many of us are now dealing with the impacts of COVID. And um, some of us are new to this kind of experience and some of us are experiencing worsening symptoms from COVID. Um, and so this session is called Teaching with Executive Dysfunction. Um, and theoretically, most of you probably know what that means because it's part of how you got here. But I'm still going to give a little definition of it for us today. And so executive functions are cognitive processes that govern task initiation, motor planning, attention, sustainment, and shifting, and other aspects of goal-oriented action. Everybody has executive function and everybody struggles with it from time to time but there are certain conditions such as ADHD and autism or depression and OCD that can exacerbate the issues related to having a difficulty with executive function. Also um, conditions of aging such as menopause and mild cognitive impairment and then even physical or emotional kinds of traumas. Um, and so what does executive dysfunction feel like? Uh, it can feel like being stuck, uh, being unable to do something that you need or want to do. 
Uh, you can feel like making a mistake during a repetitive task or uh, something that you're very familiar with, and yet somehow you still make a mistake, like taking the wrong turn on your way to work. Uh, you can feel like being disoriented and not really knowing which direction to go or where things are in space. And it can have to do with being confused, such as walking into a room and forgetting why you were there. Um, and something that we're going to talk about more and that I've talked about more in the other sessions is that metacognition are uh, the explicit uh, strategies and beliefs that a person uses to choose, plan, progress, and complete goals. So metacognition is the conscious layer on top of executive function, and it can be used to mitigate executive dysfunction. Um, and so sometimes what happens is that the strategies that everybody else is using aren't working for you because your brain is not the same. Uh, and what often happens when you are growing up with a condition of executive dysfunction is that instead of internalizing the cultural strategies of the people around you for dealing with tasks, you internalize ableism instead. You internalize the idea that there's something wrong with you. Um, and so the metacognitive strategies that I talk about in the other sessions, um, I'm going to go over them and we're going to talk about how they don't really seem to do anything for us when we're thinking about teaching. Okay, so task chunking, breaking things down, um, visual and tactile, representing tasks in prominent places to help you visualize or feel your progress, echopraxia, working alongside someone else, and anti-ableism, so internalizing a sense of identity and community around disability and the idea that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, now the last one, it can be really effective, but these other ones don't work in the classroom when you're the adult in the room and you're in charge. Like you don't usually have a body double with you <laughs> in the classroom and you usually don't even have a body double with you to grade, even if you have a TA, the role is different. Um, and so it's just a little bit like, okay, well, what do we do when we're in charge of other people and their executive function also? Um, but before we get into that, I want to acknowledge um, that not only did I not restrict this session to any certain kind of teacher, but also even within higher education, we're all in very different circumstances. So uh, we don't all have equal control over our course objectives. Uh, we don't all have equal control over our assessment methods. Some of us are required to give these like three or four exam kind of class structures. Uh, we don't have equal authority over assignments. Sometimes we're given the assignments and the syllabus and we have to teach to it. Um, and we don't all even have authority over how to conduct classroom pedagogy. So some of us can't even choose to be more active in the classroom, uh, depending on circumstances. And then, you know, some of us have very large classes and some of us have very small classes. Some of us have a TA, some of us do not have a TA. Some of us are teaching four classes and some of us are teaching one class. And all of these things make uh, everything very particular and difficult. And the less power that you have over your teaching environment, the more difficult it can be to employ strategies that work for you. And I just wanted to start with like, yes, that is a real problem. And I know that it's a real problem. And that's why a large portion of this will actually be workshopping problems with you instead of just telling you things that I think would help you, which is just ridiculous and not at all actually what I do. I'm not a motivational speaker, I'm not an ADHD coach, just a random person talking to a bunch of squares on the internet. Okay. Um, so <laughs> this next page is, um, a description of the kinds of neurodivergent burnout teachers, and it breaks them into two categories. And obviously, these are just archetypes, and they're mostly a joke. And 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 you may identify with both of them or or none of them. Uh, and I'm using characters from Brooklyn Nine Nine, which is a propaganda show, but also everybody on that show is super neurodivergent, so I'm using it. Uh, and so the first kind is the Chaos Goblin, represented by. <laughs> Uh, Jake Peralta um, and the Chaos Goblin neurodivergent teacher is winging it, 
They've got little to no lesson plans. They have unclear assignment descriptions and expectations. They're late or inconsistent with their grading. They give minimal feedback or they give feedback, but it's like too late. Like you they give feedback on something like five weeks later and you've already had to move on to the next thing. Um, grades and feedback feel like an albatross around your neck. You know that you need to grade and you're just not doing it because of all the other things in your life that you're trying to keep on top of. Uh, the other kind of neurodivergent burnout teacher is the tight ass represented by Amy Santiago, who loves binders and schedules. Uh, and you see her sitting in a pile of shredded paper. Um, class time is very regimented. There's like a, a schedule of activities or, or topics. There are detailed and lengthy assignment descriptions, and yet still students often seem confused or unable to understand what the expectations are. They're overwhelmed by their grading responsibilities. They feel like they're constantly working on their classes, even if they have other responsibilities. Um, and they just feel like they're constantly juggling every responsibility that they have. Um, again, this is a joke. And you, most of you are probably like, I am both or something. Um, but I will tell you, I am definitely Chaos Goblin. Uh, I have been Amy Santiago. I've been tight ass before. Um, I think the difference for me is that I could be a tight ass when I didn't have children and now I have children and I'm just trying to like swim through the day and tread water. So I'm chaos goblin now. Neither of them are good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're, um, but anyway, it's, yeah. All right. Um, so I looked through the, uh, questions that people asked in the submission, in the, in the registration form. And I wanted to pull out some of the big themes that I saw a number of you asking about. So there was um, a, a lot of people talking about how do you balance all the other, all the different obligations that you have both inside and outside the classroom, um, time management related to getting grading done uh, and other things like you're like a lot of us are also supposed to be writing papers and submitting to grants and conducting studies and stuff. Um, there was a, some, some very sensitive um, questions around masking neurodivergence in the classroom, the benefits and risks of disclosure, like how do you navigate actually making your own needs known in a classroom, especially as teachers, we're supposed to be open to the needs of our students. How do we talk about our own boundaries and needs? Um, and then like conflicting student needs. For example, some students love the Chaos Goblin professor and some students love the tight ass. And what happens when you're one of these or the other and uh, some of your students are thriving in that environment and others are not. Um, boundaries around how much help you should be giving and um, the whole grading problem uh, not just the time management of it, but the doing of it. And then even things like email and communication strategies, the ways that other things take up our time and our days. Um, I want to check. Oh, they're just laughing. Okay. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing a comment. Okay. So the, so these are my broad suggestions based on these big themes. And I'm not actually good at these. Okay, these are things that I know from my research would be effective, but I also know from my research are very hard to do. Um, and then we'll go into workshopping specific scenarios and solutions. But this first one is block scheduling. And this is the one that I suck at. I don't do this very well. Sometimes I get into like a mode and I can do this and sometimes I'm not. Uh, and what this means is that there's specific days or hours of days that are devoted to a specific ta task. And when that time block is over, you don't do that task anymore. I'm very, I'm very bad at this. I love binging tasks. I start on a thing and I do the thing until it's over and I don't do anything else. And so right now I'm grading and I won't do anything until the grades are over. Uh, and it's been like four days. <laughs> Oh, it's not good for me. It's not good for, it's not good, bad. Um, 
And so it's it's very hard because um, it's literally one of our, like the conditions of executive function that task switching is hard. And so even if you can like make a promise to yourself, right? The physical act of stopping is really hard. Um, so I am not good at this. Uh, I have gotten very good at only working between nine and five. Uh, that happened because I worked in very abusive work environments before I came to academia. And so once I was in a place uh, where I wasn't physically locked in the building, I was like, nope, I only work from nine to five. Uh, and I have kids that make it very difficult to work from home. And so I just can't even work. Once I pick up my children, no work happens. It is not possible. So that amount of long scheduling I have managed to make happen for me, but it's mostly because uh, my kids make it impossible. And if they, as they get older, I might begin to be a workaholic again. Um, so, uh, you know, I've seen people that only do emails uh, between like 11 and noon or between three and four, those hours that are really bad for making progress on high cognitive load tasks. Those are good hours to be like, those are my email hours and I don't touch email outside of that. Um, that doesn't always work. There are some emails that you maybe are emergent emails, but for the most part, finding a way to confine the problem tasks to these little windows helps you because you know when they are and you know when they're over. So they no longer feel like something that is always eating you because you have put them in a little box. Um, another idea that I would um, like for myself and I had before some of my friends moved away um, uh, are teaching buddies. And so these are people, they can be local like to whatever school that you're actually in or they could be you know just people that are your friends with and this is like the group chat for workshopping problems you're having in class and ideas try not to do too much shit talking in there like about students because that's just not good for anybody but like you know a place for y'all to talk about classroom mm -hmm. stuff and um um, you can also use that group for parallel play. So uh, that echopraxia that we talked about as a metacognitive strategy, if you actually schedule time together where like in the same way that we do writing groups, I don't know why I haven't seen people do grading groups where they just sit next to each other and grade for the same amount of time. And you don't have to go be at the same place. You can open up a Zoom and sit together. Uh, and in this way, you can be your accountability buddies and this can be helpful to just sort of set up a weekly club, right? Just like three people that you like. Uh, it's an idea. The other thing that can really work, and then this again is something that it doesn't work for people if they don't have as much control over their classroom, is flipped classroom strategies. Uh, and so this is stuff like in class, peer paired or grouped grading activities so they give each other feedback right away so that even if it takes you three weeks to get the formal feedback to them they have somebody else has told them some of the things that are unclear about their work or that could be improved about their work this can be really hard especially in undergrad when some of those kids are mean uh but there are things that i do in the classroom that help mitigate like mean behavior and so I, when I do peer grading activities and I structure it around like you're doing plus deltas, you're telling the person things about the assignment that uh, makes sense to them, that taught them something that are positive, that they like the way that, you know, if in my case, there's a lot of design work. So like I thought that this was really pretty or that this was very compelling. And then deltas, things that could change and how that would improve the project. Okay, so actionable kinds of recommendations. And this isn't like grading in the sense that they're giving, like I don't, some people do this, but I don't actually have the students like give you an A or a B, or I don't do that. I just have, it's just a feedback activity. And this contributes to those annoying grades for like participation or like whatever. Uh, and it's more effective than just like marking somebody absent or something. They were there that day, 
and they gave feedback, they get a point. Um, I even have uh, opportunities for students to make up that peer feedback if they weren't there for some reason, they can get that taken care of. Um, and then another thing that I think is more common flipped classroom is like student-led topic presentations and activities. So like if there's a like module rotation, you put students in charge of giving like a mini lecture that day. Um, it can be really effective if you actually have them design in-class activities. You have to model a few of them first, especially for undergrads so that they figure out like, what do you mean by an activity? But this can actually prevent you from having to do a thorough lesson plan every day. So the students are involved in uh, teaching each other. Uh, and it's not completely offloading all of your work, but it is actually, if you help scaffold it enough that they feel confident in it, they have a lot of fun versus feeling really overwhelmed by it. But um, it can be a positive experience. Um, Clear rubrics, I'm terrible at this. Um, now, there's a clear rubric for the student and there's a clear rubric for you. So giving the student a clear rubric, I'm not very good at, but I'm also not really very commonly deducting points for a lot of nitpicky things. So they almost, I just want them to see the deliverables. What do I need them to give me? And what do I need it to tell me? That's kind of my rubric for the students. The clear rubric for me is, and I keep the points. I um, everything in the class is a uh, adds up to a hundred points. And what I find that this, I've seen people do classes that are out of like a thousand points, or like they're like out of three hundred and seventy-two points or something. And I find that the more points that you give yourself, the more arbitrary the grades get. And it's like and you're thinking too hard about the math and about the numbers. And I just if stuff is out of five or 10 points, it's way easier to be like, yes, this is A work. And yes, this is B work. Like, it's not that, I don't know. This is my personal feeling and recommendation. This is not me telling you how to change how you grade. Uh, I'm just saying like, if you can identify what makes A, B, C work, then you don't have to think so hard. Um, and you can focus your energy, like you can give the uh, like the the numeric assessment, right? Like somebody could get an A and still have a lot of feedback about how they could improve. Um, and you can focus your energy on the actual constructive feedback so that they get what they need to actually learn and grow versus just being like 72 points. And you're like, okay, I guess I have to do better next time. Um, and a lot of people talk about ungrading and I'm a fan of it. I just haven't been able to make it work because most of my classes are 50 students and I'm not doing ungrading in a class of 50 students. <laughs> I'm not doing contract grading in a class of more than 10 personally. Um, I'm just checking the chats. Okay. And then the last recommendation is the one that I am fairly good at and get on fights, in fights on the internet about, which is cut the cop shit. Okay. And this is not something, some of you actually are not even allowed to do this. Like you have these strict requirements about like having to report attendance in a certain way. We can actually talk about ways to work around it depending on the specifics of the circumstance, but yeah. Uh, I don't do penalties for anything. Attendance, late work. I don't take off points for this petty shit. And one of the reasons, the primary reason that I do this is that it always punishes the student twice. The student isn't showing up. They're not gonna be doing that well. Why, why take points away from them? They're already not gonna be getting all the material that they need to do well. So there's no point. Um, if somebody turns in something late, they have something going on in their life. So like, why punish them more? Um, and, and it all just adds to your workload of having to like, to keep track of like what points are being removed for what reason. Um, and there is some pushback on this. So like, well, if you just let them turn in stuff whenever, then you, you never stop grading. 
And I don't know about that personally, because I do have classes of 50 pretty consistently, which is not a lot, but it, it um, sometimes I don't have a TA and it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a lot in a project-based like qualitative class where there's no tests or anything that has like A, B, C, D answers. Um, and I find that, um, you know, if it takes us a week or two or three or four or five to actually get grades back to people, then it doesn't matter if they're one or two or three or four or five weeks late because we're not grading it yet anyway. Once I get through all of these, I currently have a class of 40 graduate students in a qualitative methods class. It's a fucking nightmare. Uh, once I get through the 37 students that have submitted this midpoint like thing, I might see the three stragglers show up and I can grade those, right? Um, I, we can talk about like whether or not the penalties for late work is effective or not, but this is what I get into fights about on the internet. And uh, like I said, I'm not a motivational speaker or a coach or whatever. So I am just gonna say, this is what I do. I don't punish people for stuff. And it works for me, but I'm also allowed to do that. I'm allowed to not punish people for stuff. I'm allowed to be in control of assignments and makeup and how things function in the class. Um, and yes, I do have students that like turn in everything within the last week. It's usually not more than one. Uh, and if that's what that person needed to survive, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with being the person that they ignore for three months because everybody else is being a hard ass. Uh, so disclosure in the classroom, I don't do it. Uh, which is funny because if you like look at me online, it's very obvious. I have found surprisingly, despite the fact that the kids are always online, that I am old now and they aren't in the same places that I am. So they don't see me on the internet. And so some of them know, uh, but most of them don't. Uh, and so I don't really talk about it. Sometimes I do, but I do it with like a joke or a meme. So like half the students are like, oh, that's a that's a spicy brain. Like they know like the, what the joke means. Um, but otherwise I'm not like out there being like, you know, these are my diagnoses and this is what that means for me. Um, why don't I do it? Uh, cause kids are mean. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and it's not, they're, they're not just mean to us. They're mean to the, uh, each other, but they're mean to themselves. And that's, that's the thing is that we're talking to about people who, uh, even people who recognize their own neurodivergence aren't necessarily in a place where they can separate the bad feelings they have about themselves that they're getting from society, from how they behave and treat other people. So um, I just sort of try to model like unconditional positive regard from Alfie Cohn. And I just try to model like this radical permissiveness in the classroom. And it's informed by my neurodivergence and my work in neurodiversity, but it's not, I'm not gonna be like, I do these things because they have the tism. Uh, because some of the kids are mean. <laughs> so I don't do that. Um and, and that strategy again is different. There's a class that I teach sometimes called disability and techno science, and it's much smaller usually. And usually I don't get through the whole class without telling them, right? But in these big studio classes. Uh, especially the ones that are attended by people from all over the university, I just don't tell them. Uh, I'm not hide it, but if there's something that I need, like, oh, we gotta we gotta have class without the lights on today, it's because I have a migraine. Um, you know, I just I give them reasons that are more vague and more acceptable, because. Uh, um, what I have seen happen is that, especially undergraduate students who are quite young still, 
they don't know how to separate their dissatisfaction with college education from the condition that you just exposed to them. So in the same way that we know that student evaluations are harsher for women and people of color, um, once they know that you're disabled, you're no longer just quirky or annoying or eccentric. You're too disordered to be a teacher and they'll write about it and it's mean, so I don't tell them. <laughs> um, And we'll get to some of these comments in a moment. Um, so now we're at the scenario exploration, collaborative problem solving. We're at the part of this that is for you to ask questions about things that you're experiencing. And this um, session is like an hour. So we have like 30 more minutes, but I have another 30 minutes for with the people that don't want to leave, which happens usually there's people that like don't want to leave. So, um, but that's just a sense of the time that we have. Um, yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing so you can see my face. And um, I'm going to check the chat. And, and uh, let's take a look at some of we have a comment about how <laughs> classes out of like a thousand points are really annoying. Uh, single point rubric really helped Katie. Um, late submissions can mess with your own scheduling. Absolutely they can. And so that's one of the reasons why, again, I'm not good at block scheduling. I admitted that. But when I have committed to allowing late submissions, so I have made a way for that to work for me, right? So you, if you can't commit to allowing late submissions, then you'd be clear about that, right? Um, but then what happens when, you know, if a student is going to come to you and they're going to have an excuse that's reasonable or or whatever anyway, then I, I think that in some cases it's better to just plan for the fact that you're going to have late submissions and just say, okay, well, if you gave it to me three days late, I'm still not looking at it until next week. Uh, you know, um, and that's kind of the consequence, right? You were late and I'm sure like they already had some real life consequence that led to that. But the other consequence is that you don't grade it right away you grade it on your schedule. And so maybe they don't get their feedback before the next phase, right? Um, but at least I didn't get five points linked away from them for having car trouble or a medical condition or a dead cat. One of my students' apartment caught fire. His apartment is fine, but he has to move out of his apartment for like three weeks. Just, Just, yeah, get out. So, you know, stuff happens to kids. <laughs> so anyway. Um, and yes, they're mean with or without the disclosure. Absolutely, they are. Um, yeah. And, and teacher evals are terrible anyway. So I've got a question from Alice that I'll get to in a, in a second. Um, so, um, we have two questions in the chat. I'm going to sort of name them both and then talk about them. Um, how do you dig yourself out of the burnout to start with? That's a huge question. And that's from Alice. And then one from Nasheen is when to quit teaching. So being autistic and ADHD, an immigrant woman of color background, everything is much worse. The students don't, my students didn't see any person like me before teaching courses. You're in Florida, um, respects and <laughs> rest in peace. Uh, they are so mean and abusive. And every day I think of leaving this job. 
but you love teaching. I love the nature of the job, but not how unkind people are. Um, so yeah, what you're going through is really common and really unfair. And I, and I have seen this be much harder for women of color in particular who get just some of the worst abuse from students. Um, and um, I, I can connect you to some people who have similar experiences, if that might help. Um, if I could know a little bit more about what you're teaching, I can help strategize around how to deal with students um, that are behaving this way. Uh, and as for Alice and the how do you dig yourself out of burnout to start with, it's really hard. Uh, it's extremely hard. It's so hard that we spend most of our time in the community of people that are kind of studying these issues on prevention. Because by the time you get there, it's really bad. And you're of a certain age, uh, which one is not studied at all. And two, uh, menopause is super bad for us. It's the fucking worst. It's really, 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 really fucking bad. Uh, and we don't study it at all. <laughs> so we all know like menopause is hard and it does things to your brain. Uh, no, it's so bad. Um, a lot of the things that make four-year-olds diagnosable uh, with these neurodivergent conditions are things that resurface in menopause because that's how fucking haywire our bodies are going. So yeah, um, hmm, hey, it's bad, it's hard. Uh, how do you dig yourself out of the burnout? Start with number one step is to be kind to yourself and to forgive yourself. Uh, the other thing is um, this is one of those things that different people have different leeway with, okay? So like some of us can disappear and like sleep on the days when we don't need to be physically observed. Some of us can't do that. Uh, but to the extent that you're allowed to disappear, disappear. <laughs> um, but that's that's a really hard one and, and we work a whole lot on prevention because getting out of it is, usually takes a trip to the Grippy Sock Hospital vacation place. Um, one person says that they have a policy about telling you before you submit something late. Yes. So I, 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 I also make that very clear. Like, I just need to know, I just need to know that it's happening. You don't have to tell me why they always do. I'm like, you don't have to tell me why. And they're like telling me the very gruesome details of their hospital stay. And I'm like, um, it's not that I don't care. I do care. I care about them as people, but also like, I don't want people to feel like they have to share with me these terribly vulnerable things in order to get what they need. Uh, and then they share anyway. Um, uh, say no to all service if possible without repercussions. So yes, like I said, some of us have more leeway on this, but to the extent that you can disappear, disappear. So um, the extent to which you can pull back from the service that is not fulfilling and is like busy work and is like, there are people on those committees that show up but aren't there. You too can show up and not be there. <laughs> um, Um, yeah, uh, I have heard a lot about students' tummy aches, and I'm like, same. Also, you don't have to tell me. Um, and, but yes, they, they so they tell me these things because they're used to being disbelieved, and they don't believe that I'll believe them or or that I'll accept what they need without an interrogation. And so if they're emailing five professors and they're emailing them 
uh, and they have all this evidence that they've built up anyway, they're going to send it to you, even if you've told them that you don't need them to prove themselves to you. So, um, but it's, it's really rough. Um, so, uh, yeah, so more questions, you can type them or you can ask them with your mouth. You don't have to, <laughs> but the option is there. Uh, anybody, um, if there's something that you had written in the registration form that I didn't address explicitly, we can also talk about that. Um, QA is my favorite part. But it's really difficult sometimes to get people to ask me things. Could I ask Hi, a little bit? Hi. Oh. Um, could I ask a little bit about um, the kind of, uh, um, you know, you prepare as much as possible to not get snowed under or you know to to kind of make the runway as long as possible and then still something happens and so in the middle of the semester I had a this semester I I had a concussion for about three mm -hmm. weeks which led me to start an um you know a workplace accommodation process um uh, which is still you know the concussion's gone the workplace accommodation process is totally stalled and like nothing has happened and I'm buried. <laughs> so this is kind of, this is a specific version of what happens when you um, are already like any strategies for just climbing out from under the mountain. Um, so many metaphors, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so, um... It's really annoying because people will be like, you should get a planner or like whatever. And I'm going to say something that sounds like that, but it's not what I mean. Uh, so sometimes when you're feeling completely buried, um, it can be good to get yourself in front of a whiteboard uh, or post-it notes or like whatever, and just start writing down everything that you have going on, everything that you feel crushed by and start breaking them down not because you're breaking them down into by into chunks that are possible for you to tackle that's not what you're doing yet you're just trying to figure out okay what okay this is the boulder but like the boulder is made out of like multiple pieces of rock glued together or whatever so like you're trying to figure out here's your boulders and here's your pebbles right you're trying to figure out what you're buried under okay um and then once you have a sense that you know most of what's on top of you. You can still move something and get a cave in. That that's still gonna happen. But like, but like you get a sense of what's on top of you. You start moving stuff around about, well, okay, well, I have to move this one first because the deadline is X, or because the students really need this, or whatever. You start moving stuff around. This is why you have to break your boulders up into smaller pieces, is because otherwise you do the thing that I do where you binge on like the one thing. Um, so you start moving stuff around about like, okay, I have to do this one first and then I can do this one and then this one. And you start placing them in a timeline. Um, and you can even place them on an actual calendar if it helps. And that can help you see like the immovable deadlines and the flowable ones, right? The other thing is that like, I always have backup plans for my backup plans so like if I am trying to submit to a certain thing I always have okay if I but if I don't here's my plan and and it's not about like being able to give up on the thing that you're aiming for it's about knowing that if something happens like a concussion it's not ruined forever um and 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 feeling like 
your plan hasn't completely exploded. It's just been the trajectory has shifted, right? So you get your boulders and your pebbles and you start organizing stuff and you start mapping out, okay, well, I know that I have the capacity to do one thing a day. As an example, of something like, you know, having had a concussion and it's gone now, it's not gone. You might still feel this way for two years. Okay, so um, you, you start plowing out, okay, I am only doing- Y'all give me three minutes. I am only doing this one thing today but I'm going to do it. Right. And and it can be a lot easier to do things when you have given yourself permission to only do one or two things. So is um, can I help you? All right. I fixed that. Uh, so, and then you can, you can plot that out on a map, on a calendar where you can see it and you can see what's going on. And sometimes you take a thing and you keep moving it the next day and the next day, like you just keep moving it sometimes and that's okay. When you see yourself doing that though, notice that there's um, a reason. In one of my previous sessions, I said avoidance is a symptom, not a trait. So if you're avoiding something or it feels like you're avoiding something or that you just can't get to something, there's something wrong either with how the task has been framed or that you need support in that task that you're not getting um, or that you need a different plan for it or something, right? So like that's my very loose strategy for getting out from underneath the mountain. Um, but also you have to be sort of resigned to the fact that you're going to move a boulder and a bunch of other shit's going to fall on you <laughs> and that you have to do the activity again, basically. Um, but that is my recommendation. And sorry about your bruised brain meat. Pre-pandemic, I used to do bullet journaling or not exactly, but yeah. a kind of bullet planner-ish basic to-do list that had me, you know, writing it down and then moving it to the next day. And and it just, you know, collapsed in 2020 and I've never gotten it back, but maybe yeah. I need to get it back. I did, I did mine pretty consistently in grad school. Um, and then once I wasn't in classes as a student anymore, I felt like I had one less responsibility and I could manage things other ways, but I loved my journal when I needed it. And I, and I probably could have a better time if I had, if I used it more now. Um, and there's some apps that I use and sometimes the app will update and they'll change a feature and I'll get really mad and I'll throw it away and go get a new app. Like, but like, yeah, um, anything that lets you make little things and like move them around is, is good. Um, and let me check the chat. So Rebecca, Eli has a question about, um, about something similar to un ungrading or contract grading that's like allowing the student to specify what kind of feedback they want so that if they're a student that is not going to read it that you don't have to work on giving it that might work I can't imagine doing that in a unless the class is small enough that I could remember right that this person doesn't want feedback um but I think that that could work in certain contexts about um you might even be able to organize students into groups that aren't associated with a project in like your course management system of like students that want feedback and students that don't care. That that can be a method of managing who gets your attention and who doesn't. I worry about whether or not students are honest about what they want. Um, not honest with honest with themselves, like you know. Um, Um, so perfectionist tendencies. So the Amy Santiago problem, hours and hours of lesson prep to achieve perfect grading feedback. Um, 
this is this is really hard um and I always feel kind of hesitant when I say this because I feel like um it's like a like a hard to swallow pill thing but like I had said earlier like avoidance is a symptom not a trait this kind of perfectionism that actually interferes with your own fulfillment and well-being is also a symptom. I think that in this particular case, and, and often in most cases, perfectionism is a trauma response. And that you have convinced yourself that if you make it perfect, that you won't have anything bad happen. But that isn't true. There's no way that you can design the lesson in a perfect way to avoid any kind of backlash from students or unsatisfied students or whatever it is that you are being perfectionist against. So I think sometimes naming that, uh, that the perfectionism is actually an attempt to avoid punishment can help people stop because they realize that they're not going to avoid that punishment with perfectionism. Um, that punishment may actually never come um, or that whatever punishment is coming to them is not their fault. I don't know if that helps. This one, I got I to gotta respond to this one from Nasheen about, I was told that providing me accommodations can be unaccommodating for others. So recording meetings with consent is not possible since it makes others uncomfortable. So this recording meetings, there are particulars in based on what state you're in. I used to be in Florida and I'm pretty sure that Florida is a one party consent state. So if you consent to recording the meeting that you're in, you can record it. And so like, this isn't about accommodations, it's about the law. Check, because I can't remember if I have the law right for Florida, um, but like technically, yeah, you they can't stop you. Now, if you're asking like the office manager or something to do the recording, then maybe they can stop you by refusing to like do it, but you can record it and they can't, they can't stop you. Um, and as far as making other people uncomfortable, well, maybe they should be. If they're so worried they're going to say something, they don't want anybody to have a record of them saying. Um, but in the classroom, this is something that comes up in the classroom where there's a student with a classroom accommodation for recording and some other student tries to say that they can't have it because they don't, you know, um, yeah, that argument doesn't fly. Uh, and so um, similarly, if you could, if you do have a formal accommodation for recorded meetings, right, then they can't make the argument that it can't be. I mean, they will, they'll do it. They'll do it all the time and they'll fight you, but they're wrong. Um, Uh, we have a comment about by week six or seven of a term, I'm always off my game. That's not you. That's the way that we do education. Um, like all of it, like even not being in education, the whole 40 hour work week, which most of us do more than is also the problem, not you. So by six or seven weeks, we're burning out. And some of that is actually that we do too much. Uh, that I think some of us actually literally shove too much into the class. Um, if you, and, and so one thing you can do is think about like, is there a way to slow down the pace of the class with while still meeting the learning objectives? Um, because if it's punishing for you, it's probably punishing for the students and they have four or five other classes. Um, mm 
Yes. Um, well, I have a comment from Katie about uh, if all neurodiverse lovelies would speak up, we can make a shift that benefits all of us. Yeah. Um, I actually uh, have a saying about, um, I don't care what your neurotype is. I only care about your politics. And I don't mean like Republican or Democrat. They're both trash. I mean, like, it doesn't matter if you identify as neurodivergent, if you are also upholding these norms that are crushing and hurting everyone, right? Um, so I don't care what your neurotype is. I care about whether or not you are working to dismantle the oppressive system that we've all built for ourselves. Um, and um, that's kind of the thing. And one of the reasons why I do these webinars is that I believe that if you can run your class or your, you know, if you can run your class in a neurodivergent way, it's not just good for you. It's good for your students, even the ones that aren't neurodivergent and especially the ones that don't know it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I don't mean to victim blame or anything but I do think that um was like one of the things that I've said before which was in that at that time was related to parenting which is like whose expectations are these so um in this example it was um whether or not my children can dance around the dinner table at a restaurant well whose expectation is it that children sit still it's not mine, so I'm not going to enforce it. Whose expectations are it? Is it that students are reading 30 pages a week in four or more classes? It's not mine. I definitely assign that many, but I try to get these kids to realize they don't have to read them like front to back. Like you can skim it, that's fine. <laughs> so you know, like and in my particular case, I want them to skim because I want them to know where the information is, not to necessarily, it's not like a literature class where I want you to like have a deep textual understanding. So anyway, but like evaluating whose expectations are, is it that, things are this way. And if you feel like they're not actually in alignment with your own values and beliefs, then see what you can do to untangle them in your class. So we have two minutes left before I turn off the recording um, and nobody has to leave. Uh, usually people, some people will sit here and then like wanna talk to me for a minute and that's fine. But if anybody has one last question, uh, I will answer it for the recording. Yes, so um, it's definitely easier when your classes are smaller, but it, it's also um, easier when the students are in the in your class for a reason. So like when I teach a special topics class, it's always easier because I'm personally engaged and fulfilled and they're all wanting to be there. Um, and this is where if you're putting in a lot of work into your class, one of the places that it should be is in helping the students make connections between that class and the things that they care about. So if you are in one of those larger gen ed classes, or in one of those classes that's notorious for being pointless, right? Um, find a way early on in the class and make it an assignment to help the student find where is their desired career or future connected
all right, I got my internet back and everybody's gone. That's okay. But I had to come back in order to hit stop. Otherwise the recording would not release. So I'm going to do that. And see you all next time.